my dear students welcome i am here to discuss on this particular session some anti tuberculosis drugs and on the previous session we discussed the introduction to tuberculosis we also classified the drugs the first line drugs the second line drugs and we already completed the discussion of isoniazid that's inh that is the first line tuberculosidal agent which we discussed on the last session you can refer to that session for the discussion of isoniazid now we move on in this session with other anti tuberculosis agents and the first drug on the discussion is rifampin many times abbreviated as rif rmp and many times also pronounced and written in some countries as rifampicin so that's rifampin or rifampicin it's a semi synthetic rifamycin derivative originally obtained from streptomyces mediterranei so that's the source of rifampin rifampicin or rifampin it's a semi synthetic rifamycin derivative let's look at the slide the title of the slide tells you many important facts about rifampicin rifampin is cidal you need to follow the slide is bactericidal it's got good penetration in the cns is useful for meningeal inflammation the meningeal tuberculosis is got good intracellular penetration it can penetrate extremely fine in the abscesses cavities fluids and tissues look at that that's very important because the mycobacterium tuberculosis goes and resides in the abscesses cavities and the tissues deeper tissues that's why sometimes it's difficult for your drug to reach those particular tissues but rifampin has got extremely good penetration across the cavities and the tissues the dose of rifampin for adults is 600 mg per day and if the body weight is less it will be 450 mg every day and the standard dose will be 10 mg per kg body weight one important thing to remember is rifampin is always given early in the morning without food on empty stomach the drug should be taken on empty stomach early in the morning the next point says rifampin is useful for prophylaxis of tuberculosis yes it can be used for prevention and the next point says is useful against the atypical mycobacteria so that's some important points about rifampin cidal penetrates in the cns useful for tuberculosis meningitis good intracellular penetration good penetration in the abscesses cavities fluids and tissues and to be given early in the morning on empty stomach and could be useful for atypical microorganisms as well as for prophylaxis of tuberculosis let's come to the mechanism of action how does it act it inhibits the enzyme dna dependent rna polymerase in the mycobacterium it binds to beta subunit of this particular enzyme so name of the enzyme is dna dependent rna polymerase by inhibiting this enzyme it inhibits the rna synthesis that's the mechanism now we know the mechanism then it will be possible for us to know what are the methods what is the mechanism by which the mycobacteria can become resistant to rifampin number 1 mycobacteria undergo point mutations in the gene called rpo b gene Now, why this b this b stands for the beta sub unit of the dna dependent rna polymerase so rpo b gene is the gene which is encoding for the beta sub unit of dna dependent rna polymerase so microorganisms may undergo point mutations in the rpo b gene and this can reduce the binding of the drug to the enzyme this is one of the mechanisms practiced by the microorganisms we go on to discuss the adverse effects of rifampin first important thing and very interesting is rifampin gets excreted and goes inside various body fluids and gets converted into metabolites which are colored so what happens is you are receiving rifampin if you look at your eyes and tears coming out of your eyes may look orange red as if blood is coming out of your eyes urine may become orange red even the sweat the salivary secretion so that's very typical coloring of secretions 
or colored secretions, orange red secretions, is commonly seen with recombinant. Is it harmful? No, it's not harmful. But your patient, if not well instructed, might get scared of this particular phenomenon. So it's good to instruct your patient. I'm going to put you on recombinant, and you are likely to have colored secretions. And the patient will understand nothing is going wrong, especially if there is loss of red color. You see red color in your urine, orange red color. The patient might feel is bleeding through urine. So it's better to instruct your patient that you are putting the patient on rifampin. Next important adverse effect rifampin can produce is hepatitis, cholestitis, and jaundice. It can produce hepatitis, cholestasis, and jaundice. So that's about the liver. The next syndrome which is used, which is seen with the use of rifampin is called flu-like syndrome. It can lead to renal failure and nephritis. This is known on long-term use of rifampin and it can lead to various symptoms in various systems. So there is a trend to give the name as syndrome. So for example, if there is nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, they call it abdominal syndrome. If there is dyspnea, shock and collapse, the breathlessness, shock and collapse is called the respiratory syndrome. And if there is pruritus, that's itching, flushing and rash, it's called cutaneous syndrome. So there is flu-like syndrome, abdominal syndrome, respiratory syndrome and cutaneous syndrome. Then rifampicin can use to light chain proteinuria and it can lead to thrombocytopenia is another adverse effect of rifampicin. We go on to discuss the interactions or some pharmacokinetic relevance with rifampin. Number one, rifampin is a potent inducer of what I call HMES, hepatic microsomal enzyme system. You can also call it cytochrome P450, that CP450 dependent enzyme system. Which enzyme systems are induced by rifampin? Mainly, it's CYP3A4, CYP2D6, CYP1A2, and CYP2C9. They are most frequently induced by rifampin. And the result of this is going to be whatever drugs are metabolized by these systems, their metabolism is going to be rapid. Their metabolism is going to be fast. And these drugs are not going to produce the expected effect. Look at the list of drugs. And a very interesting example is oral contraceptives. If the woman is receiving contraceptive drugs, she gets tuberculosis and she is put on rifampin. What rifampin is going to do is it's going to increase the breakdown of the contraceptive drug. So the contraceptive drug is not going to achieve the expected effect and this lady can become pregnant. And she'll be surprised having pregnancy despite being on contraceptive pills. This is, this is a very relevant interaction and this is produced by rifampin because it's an inducer. So I just gave you one example of a drug interaction. Likewise, cyclosporin, protease inhibitors, anticonvulsant drugs, NNRTIs, methadone and anticoagulants, all of them, their metabolism can become rapid and their effect will be less. Next important kinetic characteristic we already discussed is the food decreases absorption of repompin. So if you eat a large amount of meal and then take rifampin, very less amount of rifampin is absorbed. Rifampin absorption is minimized. And this is why there is a dictum, take rifampin early in the morning on empty stomach. Please see to it that there is no food in your stomach before you take rifampin. So early in the morning on empty stomach. Next, rifampin goes to the liver, it goes to the bile, it follows the enterohepatic recirculation and it will get excreted in the feces and some amount in the urine. This is how rifampin moves inside the body and gets excreted. Usually there is no dose adjustment required if the patient is suffering from hepatic dysfunction or the patient is suffering from renal dysfunction. So that's an advantage using rifampin. If the patient has hepatic damage or renal damage, you don't have to do a great dose adjustment for rifampin. Rifampin is a highly plasma protein bound agent 
and there can be drug interactions with other highly plasma protein binding drugs. Rifampin is an extremely useful agent. Let's discuss what are the other uses of rifampin. The first important use is leprosy. And in leprosy, rifampin is used once in a month. And at many places, it's given as a directly observed therapy. Mind well, the patient is going to receive the drug just once in a month. So it's necessary to ensure that the patient takes the medication. And that's why the medication is dispensed in the clinic. The patient has to come to the clinic and the patient consumes the medication there itself and goes home. So that's called directly observed therapy. Uh, Mycobacterium leprae is a still slowly growing organism. The multiplication cycle is about three to four weeks. So there's no use of giving the drug every day. And actually it's given once in a month. Secondly, rifampin can be used for preventing certain illnesses and treating certain carrier states. So the important one is meningitis. H influenza meningitis, you can give it 20 milligrams per kilogram per day for four days. And for meningococcal meningitis, you can give it 600 milligram two times a day for two days. So meningitis, H influenza, as well as meningococcus. Next organism is atypical mycobacteria. For various atypical mycobacteria, rifampin is active and you can use it for atypical mycobacterium tuberculosis. Next indication for rifampin is Legionella pneumonia. And if you remember for Legionella pneumonia, we have macrolids which can be useful and the second drug which could be useful is rifampin. Surprisingly, rifampin, a drug reserved for tuberculosis and leprosy has got many uses and some important uses include alternative drug for MRSA, for staphylococcus carrier state, for staphylococcal osteomyelitis and endocarditis and the patients having prosthetic valves in whom when they are going for the procedures you want to prevent infection. So there are various uses of rifampin. The next important use of rifampin where it may be combined with doxycycline is brucellosis and brucella is sensitive to rifampin. So rifampin has got many other uses but this drug is mainly reserved for tuberculosis and leprosy. If the situation arises you can use it for so many other conditions and let me also add a condition called gram positive septicemia a rare indication but if you don't get adequate response with the other antimicrobial agents you can think of rifampin. We now move on to the next drug. We discussed INH and we discussed rifampin. We move on to the next drug, next bactericidal drug and that's called pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide gets converted inside the body into pyrazinoic acid and this pyrazinoic acid produces the effect. The dose, the standard dose is 1.5 grams. It becomes 25 milligrams per kilogram and obviously we are still discussing the cidal first line drug. So it's a first line drug. It's a bactericidal agent and this CNS written on the slide means it's got good penetration in the CNS and it is able to penetrate inside the cell. So I've written intracellular. It can go inside the cell, go, can, can penetrate the cell and affect the microorganism. The slide writes in very bold letters the first sentence, good penetration in CNS. Amongst all the anti-tuberculosis drugs, pyrazinamide has got best penetration in the central nervous system. So whenever there is CNS tuberculosis, there is no option, there is no substitute for pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide must be used, a beautiful penetration in the central nervous system. This drug gets activated by a bacteria, as we already said, and the enzyme which activates is called pyrazinamidase. And with the, with the help of pyrazinamidase enzyme, is going to get converted into pyrazinoic acid. This activation in the bacteria by the enzyme pyrazinamidase is encoded by a gene because it's pyrazinamide. The initial letters is PN and the name of the gene is small PNCA gene. PNCA gene. That's the gene encoding for the activating enzyme from the bacteria. The resistance obviously produced by the bacteria by affecting the PNCA gene. So there could be impaired uptake of pyrazinamide 
or there could be mutations in the P and C A gene and if these mutations happen then the, ends, the bacterial enzyme pyrazinamidase will not be able to activate pyrazinamide and then probably the drug won't be able to produce effect. So these are the two mechanisms of developing resistance. Number one is the impaired uptake or number two is the lack of activation of pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide is a drug which has got great capacity to produce liver damage and hepatitis. We must keep this in mind. Liver damage and hepatitis is commonly known with pyrazinamide. It produces metallic taste in mouth, gastrointestinal intolerance, drug fever and rash. And one important adverse effect, very peculiar of pyrazinamide, is it increases the uric acid. It leads to hyperuricemia and it can precipitate gout in susceptible patients. So also it is phototoxic and it is known to increase the porphyrin synthesis. The next adverse effect not just by the mechanism of gout or by increasing the uric acid but it can produce arthritis in other ways by other mechanisms and this is why with pyrazinamide polyarthritis, arthralgia and myalgia is known. So look on this slide how it's looking liver damage and hepatitis that's one important adverse effect. Skip one line and go to the next hyperuricemia and gouty arthritis and skip one line and go to the next that's polyarthritis, arthralgia and myalgia. Obviously these red letters are telling you pyrazinamide is contraindicated if the patient suffers with liver dysfunction. Liver damage or liver dysfunction is a crucial issue while your patient is receiving anti-tuberculosis drugs. I hope you have started appreciating it now with the discussion of isoniazid and with this discussion of pyrazinamide. You also need to decrease the dose of pyrazinamide when the patient has diminished renal function and especially in the patients who are on hemodialysis. So this is about some of the adverse effects of pyrazinamide. Once again to tell you pyrazinamide good penetration in the CNS. For, so use it for central nervous system tuberculosis. Important adverse effects include liver damage, hyperuricemia and precipitation of gout and polyarthritis, arthralgia and myalgia. We now move on to the next anti-tuberculosis drug and that's aminoglycoside which we already discussed under aminoglycosides but to complete the discussion here as an anti-tuberculosis agent streptomycin is bactericidal. The standard dose is 750 milligrams to 1 gram intramuscularly or 15 mg per kg body weight and is given for initial 2 months by intramuscular injection and streptomycin has got extracellular action. It's difficult for streptomycin to penetrate the cell and then go to the bacterium and kill it. So it's mainly useful for the extracellular bacilli and it's useful for central nervous system. It can achieve good concentration, fairly good concentration in the central nervous system. Mechanism of action is it inhibits protein synthesis by binding to 30S ribosomal subunit. We already said there is less intracellular penetration. It can cross the milk barrier and it can cross the placenta. And the resistance is produced by streptomycin with the help of point mutation in the gene called RPSL gene that is the S12 ribosomal protein gene and RRS gene that is the 16S ribosomal RNA. So these are the new findings point mutations are produced to streptomycin by change in the RPSL gene and RRS gene and there can be change in the ribosomal binding site because it has to bind with the 30S ribosomal subunit to initiate the inhibition of protein synthesis. As far as the adverse effects are concerned, please try to bring it to your mind, it's an aminoglycoside. So what's going to be the adverse effect? Important is going to be autotoxicity and as you know streptomycin affects vestibular component more as compared to cochlear component. So more vestibular component leading to vertigo and hearing loss that's one. The second toxicity you expect is nephrotoxicity and nephrotoxicity with aminoglycosides is in the form of tubular necrosis. 
in the form of tubular necrosis. The third toxicity you expect with streptomycin is neuromuscular blockage. I think it will be worthwhile if you go back to your aminoglycoside chapter and rush through it once again and then this chapter is going to be easy for you because it's basically an aminoglycoside. The other possible uses of streptomycin are cholera, plague, tularemia and brucellosis. Very different conditions and an aminoglycoside like streptomycin could be used for cholera, plague, tularemia and brucellosis. Next we move on to a bacteriostatic agent and that's ethambutol. It's the first line bacteriostatic agent and is used to delay the resistance to INH, rifampin and streptomycin. So that's the importance of ethambutol. If you use it along with INH, rifampin or streptomycin, the resistance to these drugs is likely to be less. Ethambutol is static but it penetrates the CNS and it can be used for the inflamed meninges with tuberculosis and has got good intracellular penetration. Its dose is 1 gram and per kilogram body weight it becomes 15 milligram per kilogram body weight. What's the mechanism of action? It inhibits arabinosyl transferases and is encoded by because it's ethambutol EMB capital CAB operon. This is the name of the gene M cap operon. This is the gene encoding arabinosyl transferase. So when arabinosyl transferase is inhibited, the polymerization of arabinoglycan or arabinogalactan is inhibited. This substance is required for cell wall synthesis. Just to make it easy, I'll remind you in penicillins it's peptidoglycan synthesis and in the mycobacteria it's arabinogalactan synthesis. Resistance will be of course produced by the mutations in EMB cap operon or the overexpression of the EMB gene product. Ethambutol produces optic neuritis and retrobulbar neuritis, a very serious adverse effect and there will be affection of visual acuity, disturbances in the color vision, especially the red-green discrimination will be affected, there will be blurring of vision and retinal damage. All this can be serious. You have to put your patient on periodic eye testing, especially if the dose of 25 milligrams per kilogram body weight is used. And please avoid it in children because the children won't be exactly able to tell you what's happening to their vision. They may not be able to differentiate properly what's happening to their vision. So ethambutol is contraindicated in children and you should monitor regularly the eye examination. Ethambutol, just like parazinamide, produces hyperuricemia and can precipitate gout, it can produce headache, confusion and peripheral neuritis and 50% of the drug is excreted in urine unchanged so it can accumulate in the renal failure. So you need to decrease the dose in renal failure especially the creatinine clearance is less than 10 ml per minute. So this is about ethambutol. So we've come to the end of the discussion of important major anti-tuberculosis agents on this session. We continue with further discussion of tuberculosis on a new session. Thank you very much and best of luck.